Dun 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 dun. Yeah, that's right. It's finally here, Razman Nights. It's the unboxing of the H, unboxing and review. Sorry, of the HMV exclusive steelbook for the Amazing Spider-Man 2 today on the Razman's Reality. Thanks once again to my pal for helping me out with the edit. And let's get the unboxing done. And while I do it, yes, I know it's ironic that I happen to be wearing a DC Batman shirt today while talking about Spider-Man, but unfortunately I don't have a Spider-Man shirt that would fit. And the Royal Mail tracking number was kind of iffy. I actually had to call my post office and it just so happened that it got released. Uh, delivered today, so at least I'm wearing some kind of superhero shirt. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, the cellophane coming off nice and easy. My dad always helps me out and starts these for me just in case the card acts funny. But so cellophane off, and so here's the front with packing. Here's the back with backing. And there's the spine, which should look the same with the backing on, and it does, because I just glanced down on it. But yeah, now here, of course, comes the real test for any true steelbook aficionado. Will it come off without leaving glue on the back? The backing. Here it goes. Bottom off. Oh, this actually isn't glue, this part. For HMV, it looks like it's just tape. So, we'll see how well it goes. Um, and the bottom came off a lot simpler than the top is. But yeah, okay, there we go. And look at that, no marks. Absolutely beautiful. Thank goodness for HMV and being smart in the way they do their backing. So, here's the front. Minus the backing. minus the bagging that's fine so yeah really really happy about this this is gonna go really really nice with my region one best buy steelbook of the first film huge thank you to the two guys who made this possible the guy who wanted to give it to me as a gift so I could finally review and see the film my buddy Andrew and the awesome Andy Leach from the everything blue group on Facebook for doing group buys for these for those of us in the US who don't have access to these deals so that is the unboxing and I'll be back with a review through the magic of magic of editing right now. Yeah, it's two days later. Reason being is because A, this Blu-ray was like chock full of epicness. And B, it took a long time for me to be able to get all the way through it because of some personal things that have been going on this week. So but before we can get into all of the stuff that made the Blu-ray so full that the review portion took so long, we of course first have to talk about the film itself. And you know what? This m film proved my point that I said to Andrew, who helped me get this, and I've said to plenty other of my friends in the past, fanboys just complain most of the time purely for the sake of complaining because other than a few things here and there which I will cover 
there was absolutely nothing wrong with this film and this film continued the great job of Mark Webb and the amazing Spider-Man vision of being more true to not just the Spider-Man mythos but more importantly for this type of film if you're going to do a film that is less about comic books and more about the reality of what life would be like as a superhero more importantly the story of Peter Parker himself and the relationships of Peter Parker himself and the importance of Peter Parker being more vital to who Spider-Man is than Spider-Man's radioactive superpowers could ever be. And this is an incredibly powerful story that opens up with the father's point of view, with Richard Parker's point of view, right from the very beginning, showing us the beginning of the first Amazing Spider-Man once again, but like I say, from his point of view. And it shows why the parents made the decision they made and what they were trying to protect and the parents are killed and there's this horrific plane crash and camera goes black and coming for about 30 seconds and coming right out of that black for about 30 seconds is Peter as Spider-Man falling through the sky and letting out a joyous scream and to me, that was like, oh my god, Mark Webb completely, completely gets Spider-Man because until F Peter faces, sorry, almost said Peter paces, almost got it backwards, <laughs> but until Peter faces that adversity that will come later in his arc, for him, it's just all about being fun. Or having fun as Spider-Man. You know, letting Spider-Man be fun is what I was trying to say. You know, he's taken the death of Uncle Ben and realized that he has these great powers and he can just have a blast with it. And this movie shows the leaps and bounds of the technology with CGI and how CGI, when done right, can really blend together with real life elements and really make you lose yourself in a story because you see the littlest of detail because Peter's suit even ripples when he's flying through the air. It freaking ripples. And for somebody that's so detail oriented like me, that is a huge deal. So yeah, right from the very beginning, this movie grabs your attention and makes you realize that this isn't going to be your typical Spider-Man movie because this isn't going to be a movie about oh, Spider-Man's the good guy Electro and Goblin and at the end Rhino over here are bad guys. This is about death and the consequences of death and how life is shaped by death. It opens up with the death of his mother and father and of course we all know that this entire film led up to arguably the most iconic death in all of comicness the death of Gwen Stacy because the death of Gwen Stacy when Marvel did that was really the first time because we're talking about before the death of the second Robin or was it the third Robin? can't remember now I'm trying to think was it the second or third? I, I can't remember if it was Tim Drake or if it was um she and I even can't remember the third Robin's name. God, I'm being a terrible fanboy right now. But anyway, probably because I'm in a Marvel mode and not a DC mode. But anyway, my point is, before that death of Robin happened, or before the various 
time that Superman has died and been brought back to life before how Jordan died and was brought back to life before any of that the death of Gwen Stacy had to happen and what made it so important was that it was really the first time they ever saw the superhero fail on such an epically important large scale with such huge consequences to his life I mean because not only did he fail but he failed miserably and I applaud Mark Webb and Avi Arad and the producers and decision makers of this film and and Andrew Garfield for being one of the great, greatest method actors I've seen in many years and Emma Watson of course embodying Gwen Stacy I just applaud everybody involved in this because not only did they find a way to stay true to Gwen's death because they had her neck snap but they added such subtle things to it that made it even better because they moved it from her falling off the bridge to her falling out of a clock tower during a epic final battle between Harry and Goblin and they even did something that I was just I couldn't believe how much I felt like Mark Webb was in my brain because this as I mentioned earlier I believe in a previous video if not earlier in this review during the unboxing portion I didn't get to see this film in the cinema so I had all kinds of time to build up like how should they do this and do it right because I knew I was one of the people a lot of people said it was a mystery and that they didn't really figure it out until it leaked that that's what the filmmakers were gonna do but I always knew that Sorry, I was just trying to get Claire off the steelbook cover there. That was bothering me. But uh, I always knew that, and it might do it again because it just slides on the tray. But anyway, I always knew that right from the ending of the first film that if they were going to introduce Gwen Stacy, there was no way that they could do, they could continue this realistic true to the comic book tone of the Peter Parker story without addressing Gwen's death and so I had all this time before the second movie was even officially greenlit to build up in my head about how I would do this and one of the things that I always wanted to see visually because I felt like it was something that could be done now that couldn't have been done in film before and wouldn't have been conceptualized in a comic because you know they weren't about flashiness at that time was what if Peter's web when he shoots it down to try to save Gwen's life what if it turned into a little hand and that's exactly what happens in this film a little hand is formed out of the webbing in the scene itself and I was so blown away by that I almost cried in a good way I mean it was just so so well done so we've covered Gwen and how well the other the last thing I want to talk about about Gwen is how the filmmakers and the storytellers here made the conscious decision going back to the first film and really continuing this film to let Gwen be a strong character you know she's not just a femme fatale damsel in distress much the way that no no offense intended because you know without the origin the character wouldn't exist but much in the way that she actually was written back in the 1960s or she was just a bombshell femme fatale with no real substance that filmmakers in this story they made a real effort to make her an equal to Peter in every way from the way she carried herself and the, her smarts and everything else and there's a really really important scene as the two are together during the final battle 
with Electro that sort of leads up to the moment of her death where she point blank tells Peter this is my choice you understand that my choice nobody makes my decision for me this is my choice and I'm here because this is what I want to do and that was so powerful because of Peter struggling in the beginning with the promise that he made to Captain Stacy in the last film of making sure that he left Gwen out of it and seeing the characters break up and struggle to be apart and just the power of their relationship and then you saw the fact in that Andrew Garfield and Emma Stone are in love with each other in real life I just have never seen a more powerful relationship on screen and so when they introduce Mary Jane into this franchise they're never going to have more work to do with any introduction of a new love interest than they've had than they will have with this franchise because of how strong the character Gwent was. Now what about Electro? Jamie Foxx as Electro. Well, Jamie Foxx as Electro was a two headed animal in this film. When it got to the Electro portion, I thought that the filmmakers captured that perfectly. I thought that the new gray suit, you know, because obviously the green and yellow colors aren't going to work for a major film like this. Uh, so I thought that was really well done. I thought that the psychological aspects of the character were really well done. So when it came to Electro and how Jamie Foxx embodied that character, even doing subtle things like changing his voice because he was burned by electric eels and his vocal cords had been burnt I thought that was amazingly well done the issue that I had was that the Max Dillon character which should be the setup to the Electro character in my mind while well, well done and I agree with the vision that Jamie Foxx had for Max Dillon and it would have been what I would have done as well I thought that he was too passive and too almost like just schizophrenic rather than showing that it's a slow build and it is the betrayal of feeling like you have nobody in the world that makes you the way you are. I thought that the filmmakers in this instance paid too much attention all film long to subtle hints, subtle hints, subtle hints of who he's going to become. I thought that Max Dillon should have been a much more well-rounded character with just maybe a hint of psychotic until he became Electro. I thought that in this case they tried too hard to make a character into something he wasn't and subsequently as good an actor as Jamie Foxx is I thought that he didn't really get a lot to work with. So yeah that's my feelings on Jamie Foxx's Electro. Great choice for the villain because of the story and we're going to lead into that right now but great choice of the villain because of the slow build story that they told of the goblin and really well done just kind of rushed in the pre electro stage I thought and now we're going to talk about to wrap this up and this is going to be one of the longer videos I've ever done now because of the unboxing part in front of it because I didn't really think that I would have this much to say about the film but I did but anyway um, we're going to talk about to wrap this up the very let's face it controversial in a lot of people's eyes decision that the filmmakers made about not having Norman Osborn be the Green Goblin but to skip over the whole need for a Hobgoblin because you go straight to Harry Osborn being the Green Goblin and Andrew and I were talking 
before I filmed this review, before I had a chance to listen to the commentary, and we thought that it was something out of the ultimate line in terms of going that way. And while it turns out that the look of the goblin in the film, which was extremely well done, and the way that the serum kind of shaped him, that was very much taken out of the ultimate line. But the actual decision to make Harry the Green Goblin and the story that they told, that was a complete invention of Mark Webb and the filmmakers. And I learned that from the commentary itself. So yes, there's a reason to wait for commentary before you do a Blu-ray slash film review for a film you've never seen. Because even with a package as robust as this one, which we will still touch on, but even with a package as robust as this one, you are still going to learn things that you didn't know before about the film. And that was a key one. That this was a conscious decision they made because they wanted to tell an interesting character driven story that had never been told before and you know what I loved it and it's the story that I would have told I've had similar stories run in my head and what they did was they had the Osbournes have a gen gen oh, I always struggle with that word a genetic genetics I, th I think there's, or is it genetative? I think that's what it is. It's, uh, they had him have a genetative disease. I hope I got that terminology right if I didn't cheat me, I guess, metaphorically. But, uh, yeah, they had a genetative disease called something hyperplasia. I forget the first part of it. But basically what this disease did, and it's a real disease by the way, because I googled it before filming, but they had this disease be the reason that the need to become the goblin was made, because this disease is a di disease that kills you quickly and takes away your, your ability to live really quickly and you deteriorate really quickly. So Norman Osborn had spent a number of years in genetic research trying to save his life and and you know cut short the disease and what happens is that Harry makes a discovery through archival footage he found of his father and Peter's father, Richard Parker, working together that the spiders, the same spider that bit Peter and made him Spider-Man, those spiders have genetic material that he thinks can heal him because the blood has the ability, the spider blood has the ability to make the subject heal naturally and, and get rid of disease and what he doesn't realize and what ends up making him the goblin is that only the Parker blood can work because of a caution that Richard Parker took because he knew that Norman Osborne and the rest of Oscorp had kind of gone down a slippery slope to the evil side. So he made it to where only his genetics could actually mix with the spider DNA. Hence why Peter could become Spider-Man. And why when Harry took this, the um, venom of the spiders, he became the goblin. So, because of the hyperplasia, and because of the incompatible spider's blood, sorry, the still book slid there, um, but because of the hyperplasia, and because of the incompatible spider blood, Harry actually ends up looking like a goblin, rather than having a need to have him masked. So, what could have been a very contra 
controversial decision I thought was amazing because I thought the story arc was amazing and I think that Dane who plays Harry in this film just embodied it perfectly I mean the theme of Peter and Harry being two young boys who struggle to find their fathers and who were basically orphaned by their fathers and the decisions their fathers made ultimately shaping who they are I thought that Harry did a great job of, of turning all that angst and turning learning that he has this genetic disorder and then he's gonna die into the need to become the Green Goblin and just played subtle evilness and subtle sinisterism so well throughout the film and I just loved everything about his performance so I can't wait to see the third film in the Amazing Spider-Man arc now I spent a heck of a lot of time reviewing the film so just to to go through the special features really quickly I thoroughly enjoyed all the feature I achieved we have a number of robust robust sorry featurettes which will showcase the decisions behind the story, the direction they were trying to make in the story, the themes of a story, the amazing score in this film, which is the perfect fusion of classical score with the amazing Hans Zimmer and modern music with artists like Fer F Pharrell. And yeah, everything you could want in the film was already on here, which really makes me curious what is on that Target exclusive bonus disc that you can only get in a Target edition because they already covered so much here. But yeah, it has everything that the first film had that it was loaded with that made you a fan of it. So, really great featurettes. For the first time in a long time though, all of the deleted scenes I thought were choices that were easy ones to make. There was nothing in the film and I realized that I accidentally glossed over Rhino so I have to go back and talk about Rhino here to wrap this up in a minute. But anyway, just to try to keep somewhat of a flow with what I was saying, the for the first time in a long time with this set there was no deleted scenes in the film that would have made the film better. Even the best deleted scene, which was a play around with an idea that the filmmakers had of bringing back Richard Parker and an incredibly powerful scene between Peter and Richard that never saw the light of day in the film and had some very poignant stuff about hope and why death makes us who we are and how Richard could not imagine a world where deaths like the loss of Peter's mother and deaths like the loss of Gwen didn't mean anything don't mean anything that you have to carry them with you and death is a part of shapes who you are it was some very strong and very powerful stuff but the thing is it just doesn't work in the context of the film or wouldn't have worked because he just got over the emotional horror and deaths of Gwen and when you do that and you have that happen the only person that made sense to try to rally Peter back was a the parental figure that he always had in Aunt May and yeah I can't take away Aunt May's job and that aspect of it but also Gwen herself Gwen's speech herself, her Victorian speech that Peter misses in the beginning of the film because he's in the chase with Alexei Sid Savage who would later of course become Mino that speech itself is what brings Peter back and helps Peter realize through Gwen's own words that Gwen understands the importance of being Spider-Man and why Peter has to go on with his life and why he has to let Spider-Man exist once again. So yeah, the filmmakers made all the right choices, but the scene that would have been 
with the decision to let Richard survive the plane crash is something that's very powerful and is a really good standalone scene so highly recommend watching that one as well as the rest of the deleted scenes even though they don't really have much compared to that one and like I said very strong very informative commentary with all of the producers and of course the legendary Avi Arad so very robust package extremely extremely well done and now back to Rhino because I accidentally glanced over him. Of course, it was a dream of Paul Giamatti. He went on, I believe it was David Letterman, although it could have been Jay Leno, I'm not sure. But he went on a late night talk show a number of years ago and talked about how it always had been a dream of his to play the Rhino in a Spider-Man film. And he got this chance. And even though it was a very small character that was just about booking and ending the film, where in the beginning of the film, when he's battling Alexei Sid Savage, the city's not exactly sure if Spider-Man's a hero or a villain or if he's just creating chaos for the city because he's trying to do a job that he shouldn't do to at the end of the film it's redemption for Spider-Man and Spider-Man's the only one that can stop Rhino and that moment or in that moment so even though it was a very very short role and he didn't get much time on screen because he's more or less there as a story point and not so much a villain in this film I thought that it was very well done. You could see how passionate uh, Paul Giamatti was in the role because of how long he wanted to play it. And let me just tell you this, if you didn't see this film, you got to see this film if you're a Spider-Man fan because of the hints that come at the end of the film. And I'm going to have to spoil it because I'm using it as a selling point to see the film. The Sinister Six is coming. And that's all I'm going to tell you about, but there's specific scenes as well as things that are done with the entirety of the end credits that leave no doubt in your mind whatsoever that the Sinister Six is going to happen. So I'm so psyched up to see that. So I hope you all enjoyed the unboxing and review of the... HMV exclusive steelbook Blu-ray of The Amazing Spider-Man 2. Once again, huge thank you going out to Andrew and also Andy from the Everything Blue steelbook group for allowing this to happen. And as I said in the beginning, da-na-na, da-na-na, da-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-